Hi everyone, and welcome to the Panama Canal. With the 2021-22 cruise ship season underway, and everyone anxious to travel again, I thought this would be a great time to make a video about the Panama Canal exclusively for cruise ship passengers. The Panama Canal is Central America's premier cruise ship destination. Every year, more than 250 cruise ships transit the canal, and during their passage, hundreds of thousands of passengers disembark to partake in excursions. So, if you're planning a cruise to Panama, then this video is for you. I've broken the video down into two sections. One, I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to the canal. Most of you, I presume, have never been to Panama, so this will help get you oriented. Two, then we'll embark on a full southbound transit. Our transit will commence in Cologne, on the Atlantic and conclude in Panama City on the Pacific. In the process, we'll pass through all five sets of locks, under all three bridges, and through the famous Gaillard Cut. So, if your cruise ship is only calling to port and not making a full or partial transit, you need not worry because you will get to experience a full transit right here. Section 1. Introduction. An excellent place to start is with this elevation map. Some of this is self-evident, but important nonetheless and worth spending a few minutes on. First, the canal nearly divides Panama into two equal parts. As you can see, it's a tad bit closer to Colombia than to Costa Rica, but not by much. Second, the canal measures approximately 50 miles in length and transverses north-northwest. The only part of Panama that is narrower I've highlighted with a red circle, where the country measures just 37 miles coast to coast. Third, water for the canal is obtained from a vast watershed that covers 1,150 square miles, an area seven to eight times the size of Gatun Lake. The area highlighted in red represents the rainwater catchment area and includes the rivers and dammed lakes that extend across both sides of the canal. All the rainwater collected from this area is diverted into the canal and with good reason. Approximately 52 million gallons of fresh water are needed for each vessel that transits, 26 million to raise the ship to the height of Gatun Lake, and another 26 million to lower it back down to ocean level. So you can appreciate just how important it is to protect the watershed. Fourth, the canal basin is arguably Panama's lowest lying region. Most of the canal's terrain does not exceed 300 to 400 feet in elevation. Ancon Hill, which resides on the Pacific coast, is the highest point along the canal, and it measures just 653 feet above sea level. That's about half the height of the Empire State Building. And on this map, it's imperceptible. And lastly, the canal consists of four key components. The locks, of which there are five, the dams, of which there are three, Gatun Lake, and Gaillard Cut. And I'll be talking about each one in detail during our transit. Section 2. Southbound Transit Before commencing transit, I want to bring up this map of the canal, so that it's easier for you to follow. I've divided the transit route into seven sections. The only area I won't speak of is Section 2. Despite being a beautiful part of the lake, there are no excursions to this area or places of interest worth mentioning. For the most part, the transit route and railway run parallel to each other the entire length of the canal. The lone exception is where the transit route steers west through Gatun Lake's deepest and most expansive part, which corresponds predominantly to section number two of the transit map. The railway, on the other hand, maintains a relatively straight trajectory. It spends most of its time beside the channel except where it crosses over Gatun Lake. And throughout its journey, the railway always remains east of the canal. It never crosses over to the west side. If I remove those yellow sections, it all becomes much more apparent. Let's begin our southbound transit with section number one, the northernmost part of the canal. After passing through the breakwater, your ship will enter Limon Bay. If your itinerary calls for a full or partial transit, it will continue straight along the white dotted line towards Gatun and Aqua Clara locks. If Cologne is a scheduled port of call, then your ship will steer left and follow the red dotted line to either the home port or Cologne 2000. 
Here is an old photo of the Carnival Freedom at Cologne 2000. The home port and Cologne 2000 port are neighboring ports that receive most of the cruise ships visiting Panama. There's a cement path connecting them, and it takes just a few minutes to walk from one to the other. While Cologne 2000 is recognized as the official cruise ship terminal, most ships call the home port. The problem with the home port is that it has just two or three small retail stores, so anyone wanting to purchase souvenirs has to walk to the neighboring Cologne 2000 port. Thankfully, a new commercial mall between these two ports is currently under construction, and I'm hopeful it will be ready before the start of the 22-23 cruise season. Well, now that you know where those two ports are situated, let's return to the transit route. Further south along the channel is Pier 6, also known as Cristobal Port. Until five or six years ago, Pier 6 was a fully functioning cruise ship terminal. Then, unfortunately, management decided to exit the cruise ship business and concentrate solely on commercial shipping. Consequently, they bulldozed the entire terminal and all that remains is an empty pier. The building that you see behind and on the right of the Queen Mary II was the terminal. Despite no longer having a terminal, there's still a possibility that your ship will call at Pier 6, but only if your vessel is behind schedule or too large to call at the other two ports. Behind Pier 6 is the Panama Canal Railway Terminal. It's no more than 10 or 15 minutes from the port. If you are partaking in the Panama Canal Railway excursion and disembark in Cologne, your tour will likely commence here. If you disembark on either Flamenco or Perico Islands on the Pacific, your tour will probably begin on the other end of the canal and terminate here. After passing Pier 6, your ship will pass under the newly built Atlantic Bridge, the third and northernmost bridge to cross over the canal. It's also the longest of the three bridges, measuring 9,252 feet. In contrast, the Bridge of the Americas, which resides on the other end of the canal, is only 5,425 feet in length. Construction on the Atlantic Bridge began in January 2013 and ended in August 2019. Those of you participating in the Fort San Lorenzo excursion will cross over the Atlantic Bridge, which is about 20 minutes from the port. Once your bus nears the crest, you'll have panoramic views of the canal on both sides. To the right, Limon Bay and the canal's entrance. To the left, Aqua Clara and Gatun Locks. Aqua Clara is the larger of the two and is to the far left. Unfortunately, they're both off in the distance, but you should still get a good look at them when passing. Make sure to sit in the same seat when returning to ensure you see both sides of the canal when crossing over the bridge. Shortly after the bridge, the channel splits into two lanes. If your ship is transiting through Gatun Locks, it will veer to the right. Gatun Locks, like Miraflores and Pedro Miguel Locks, was built during the initial construction era. Those using the newly built Aqua Clara locks will proceed to the left. Most cruise lines are still sending their ships through the Gatun locks, with Princess Cruise Lines one of the few exceptions. Your itinerary should specify through which of the two locks you will be transiting. If not, you can always consult with your cruise line. If I had to pick between them, I'd prefer to transit through the old set of locks or Gatun locks. Despite being the smaller of the two, there's more to see. Gatun locks consists of two lanes, so you're likely to get a close-up view of other ships as they transit through the locks alongside. Now, cruise ships are unique in that they often conduct what is known as partial transit. However, most vessels complete full transits, meaning they traverse through the canal from one ocean to another. Cruise ships making a partial transit enter Gatun Lake and anchor in front of the Gatun Yacht Club. As you can see on the map, it's right around the corner and dead smack between both locks. So it shouldn't take your vessel any more than 15 to 30 minutes to get there after departing the locks. Once the ship drops anchor, anyone who has signed up for an excursion will be ferried to the yacht club aboard tenders. They'll have buses waiting for you and your tour will start from there. And while you're out enjoying Panama, the ship will repeat the same process, only this time in reverse it will transit through the same set of locks a second time and then head to one of the three ports I mentioned earlier. Now here's something for you to keep in mind. When your excursion is over, you will be taken directly to the port. 
you will not be returning to the Yacht Club, so make sure not to leave anything behind. Anything you leave behind will likely stay behind. Alongside Gatun Locks is Gatun Dam, which was built between 1907 and 1913. It measures 2,625 feet at its base and 738 feet along the waterline, making it the largest of the three dams. I took this picture from the road that passes alongside the dam, looking back towards Gatun Lake. If you are transiting through Gatun Locks, you should see the dam off to the right. The two are adjacent to each other. Those of you passing through Aqua Clara Locks will need to wait until your ship nears the Yacht Club. The problem with these earthen dams is that not much is visible above the waterline, so it's helpful to know where to look beforehand. Otherwise, you could easily miss it. This section of the Chagres River that you see behind Gatun Dam is known as the Lower Chagres. If you follow it to its end, it empties into the Caribbean Sea at the base of Fort San Lorenzo. The Upper Chagres, which I'll speak about in section number four, is located further south near Gamboa. After clearing the locks, all vessels conducting a full transit pass through Gatun Lake. If your ship is not making a full or partial transit and you wish to see the lake, you will need to visit the Aqua Clara Visitor Center. Unfortunately, the lake isn't visible from any of the ports. And that concludes section number one. Before moving on to section number three, I want to talk briefly about the locks themselves without getting overly technical. In all fairness, this subject deserves a video of its own. In addition to being a freshwater canal, the Panama Canal is lock-based. Every vessel, irrespective of its dimensions and type, is lifted 85 feet above sea level to reach the height of Gatun Lake, and then is lowered back down to sea level on the canal's opposing side. It doesn't matter if you are transiting on a cruise ship or a rowboat. The procedure is the same. The lifting and lowering of the vessels on both ends of the canal is accomplished using a series of locks. In this regard, both the old and new lock systems perform similar tasks. They just go about it differently. To highlight their similarities and differences, I placed these two illustrations adjacent to each other so you can see them simultaneously. The top illustration is of the old lock system. These include Gatun, Miraflores, and Pedro Miguel locks. Those three locks were built during the initial construction era and share the same physical and design characteristics in most cases. The lower illustration is of the new system. These include Agua Clara and Cocoli locks. To the best of my knowledge, they are identical. Now, I'm only going to touch on the five most relevant and recognizable differences between them, because if I delve any deeper, we'll be here for days. The first and most glaring difference between them is that the old lock system consists of two traffic lanes, whereas the new locks have only one. Those two lanes, which are commonly known as the east and west lanes, permit vessels to travel in the same or opposite directions at any given time, depending on traffic needs. Separating the two lanes is a center wall, which extends to the very end of the locks, well beyond the chambers. This photograph of the northbound vessels in Gatun Locks shows both transit lanes, the control tower and the center wall. The control tower in all three locks resides on the center wall, and in this photo, also taken in Gatun Locks, you can see just how far the center wall stretches. The new locks do not have a center wall with only a single lane. Second, the new chambers are considerably larger and as a result accommodate much bigger ships. Each of the new chambers measures 1,400 feet in length, long enough to accommodate New York's Empire State Building lying down. On such a small screen, it's difficult, if not impossible, to convey just how big they are. This picture of the two northmost chambers in Aqua Clara Locks was taken from the Aqua Clara Visitor's Center. Third, the new locks consist of nine water-saving holding tanks or basins. There are three per chamber. They allow for the reuse of approximately 60% of the water used during each vessel transit, which is considerable. With this savings, the new locks discharge 7% less water than the old locks, despite their immense size. If you look to the left of this vessel, you can see the holding tanks. The old set of locks does not utilize this system. Fourth, the old locks use chamber doors that rely on hinges to open and close, 
much like a traditional pair of doors, except that when closed, they're not parallel to each other. Instead, they form a V, as you see in these pictures. This is because when the chambers are full, they hold nearly 27 million gallons of water, and a pair of doors that close traditionally would never be able to withstand all that pressure. So, by designing them this way, the weight and pressure of the water inside the chamber forces and keeps the doors closed. These particular chamber doors measure 7 feet in width, and when the handrails are raised and in position, you can walk across them. They are, in fact, the only way to get from one side of the walks to the other. The handrails remain retracted when the doors are open and lift once the door is secure and in place. When the doors are open, they're nestled inside a recessed compartment along the chamber walls to ensure they don't impede transiting vessels. This photo of an empty chamber in Miraflores locks does a terrific job of illustrating just how this works. The pair of doors to the right is closed and the other to the left is open and directly under the control tower is the cavity that accommodates the doors. On the other hand, the new locks employ a completely different type of door. They are pocket doors, a kind of sliding door. They move back and forth when opening and closing, into and out of an empty cavity. They are not on hinges and always remain perpendicular to the chamber. Here's a close-up view of the chamber doors at Aqua Clara locks. These doors measure 33 feet in width making them almost five times wider than those used in the old locks. They're so big, it takes five minutes for them to open and close, and you can even drive across them. If you happen to be departing from the Gatun Yacht Club on an excursion, then your tour bus will cross over one of these doors. Fifth, the old set of locks utilizes electric locomotives, or mules as they are known, which run parallel to the chambers and the entire length of the locks. Here's a close-up of a locomotive in Gatun locks as it moves from one chamber to another. And in these two pictures, you can see locomotives alongside the vessels. Three or four locomotives accompany most large commercial vessels on each side through the locks. Their primary purpose is to keep the ship centered inside the chambers so that its hull doesn't hit the chamber walls. Locomotives and vessels remain connected by long steel cables, which you should be able to see in these photographs. You will not see locomotives in Aqua Clara or Cocoli locks. In the new ship locks, vessels maintain their position inside the chambers using propellers built into the ship's hull known as bow and stern thrusters. Okay, now that we've covered the locks in more detail, let's jump to section 3 of the transit map, which includes Barro, Colorado and Monkey Island. To make sure everyone knows where we are, we'll take a quick look at the transit map. In this section, the channel narrows considerably, and the train reappears off to the left. It also marks our departure from Gatun Lake. Off to the right is Barro, Colorado Island, the largest forested island in Gatun Lake. Barro, Colorado is managed by the Smithsonian Institute, which maintains several trails and a research facility on the island. If you are transiting the canal on a yacht or small cruise ship, there's a chance that you'll stop here but large cruise ships will not. There's no place for them to anchor, and the research facility is far too small to accommodate such large groups of people. Right around the corner and to your left is Monkey Island, which happens to be one of the more popular excursions. Tours to Monkey Island depart from Gamboa, a small community that resides further along the canal and in the next section. This section just might be the most beautiful part of the canal you'll see during your transit. Unlike Gaird Cut, and the area surrounding the locks, which have been deforested and dredged, this area remains pristine. Both sides of the channel are blanketed with dense, verdant rainforest, and there's a slew of small islands and inlets. It's very picturesque. Anyone participating in the Monkey Island tour will get to see this area up close as your tour boat shuttles you from one island to another in search of white-faced, howler, and monotiti monkeys. After navigating through a series of bends, you will reach section number four, the midway point of our transit. This section also includes the village of Gamboa, which despite its small size, has a lot going on. The first thing you'll encounter is the Panama Canal dredging and maintenance divisions. Most of the canal's heavy equipment is stored and maintained here, so you should see an assortment of tugboats, barges, launches, excavation equipment, and cranes 
just like this one. You'll then pass the transit dock. If you're partaking in the Panama Canal transit excursion, your tour will commence or conclude here. It depends on where and when you disembark and your ship's itinerary. Northbound transits are more common and depart from the Amador Causeway. Southbound transits, on the other hand, get underway here. A bit further ahead and on the other side of the train tracks is the Gamboa boat ramp. Tours to Monkey Island depart from and return here. It's not the French Riviera, but you'll have panoramic views of the Chagres River and Gamboa Resort from the dock. Speaking of the Chagres River, in section number one I spoke of the Lower Chagres and briefly mentioned the Upper Chagres. Well, this is the Upper Chagres. And since we're here, I want to take a few minutes to touch on the canal's three embarkment dams. It will help you better understand how fresh water for the canal is collected and managed. Madden Dam is located just north of Gamboa on the Chagres River. It was built between 1932 and 1935, nearly 20 years after construction on the canal ended. Its primary purpose is to increase the holding capacity for the locks and help regulate the flow of water entering Gatun Lake. Unlike the other two dams, Madden Dam is a considerable distance from the channel, therefore you won't see it during your transit. This illustration features the canal's three dams and three lakes. About midway down and to the right is Madden Dam, and just north of it is Lake Alahuela. The Chagres River starts from the northernmost part of Lake Alahuela. As it proceeds south, the water is impounded by Madden Dam, forming Lake Alahuela. The river continues south-southwest and splits when it reaches Gamboa. A portion of the water flows north towards the Atlantic and is impounded by the Gatun Dam, forming Gatun Lake. All you see between Baro Colorado Island and Gatun Dam is considered Gatun Lake, and upon its completion, it was the largest artificial lake in the world. And while several other rivers feed into it, the Chagres River is the lake's primary source of fresh water. The remaining water flows south-southeast from Gamboa through Gayard Cut and towards the Pacific. The river is impounded by the Miraflores Dam, forming Miraflores Lake in the process. So, there you have it. Three dams and three lakes. And not surprisingly, the larger the lake, the larger the dam. And it's all made possible thanks to the Chagres River. Without it, there would be no Panama Canal. Now that we've wrapped things up in Gamboa, it's time to enter the famous Gaillard Cut, which marks the beginning of section number five. So again, let's take a quick look at the transit map. And this time, I want you to take notice of section number five and number six, because I'm going to jump to section number six rather quickly. Gaillard Cut, or Calabra Cut as it is commonly known, is a thin nine mile long section that winds through the Continental Divide and connects Gamboa with Pedro Miguel Locks. From 1907 to 1913, 6,000 men worked on this project with an estimated 60 million pounds of dynamite used during the excavation process. Now, even though the southernmost portion of the Gaillard Cut resides in this section, I'm going to bring up the map for section number six. You know Gaillard Cut is a famous part of the canal and lots of people ask about it, but aside from the cut itself and the railway, there isn't much to see. To fully appreciate its enormity and importance, you have to transit through it. As you approach the southernmost portion of the cut, which corresponds to the upper left part of this map, your ship will pass under the Centenary Bridge, the second bridge built to cross over the canal. It was inaugurated on August 15, 2004, and opened for traffic on September 2, 2005. This photo was taken from the roadside looking west across the canal. Here we have a container vessel emerging from the cut. It's nearing the bridge but hasn't yet passed under it. And this car carrier has already cleared the bridge and is just moments away from reaching Pedro Miguel Locks. And you can see the bridge in the background. I took these two photos from Luisa Hill, which resides alongside the canal and east of Pedro Miguel Locks. Only Ancon Hill, which I mentioned earlier, has a higher elevation with the canal basin. Our arrival at Pedro Miguel Locks brings us to section number six, this same map. Just south of the Centenary Bridge, the channel again splits into two lanes. If your ship veers to the right, it will transit through Cocoli Locks, 
which like Aqua Clara locks, was built during the recent expansion. Vessels that steer left will transit through Pedro Miguel and Miraflores locks. Here are a few pictures of the Pedro Miguel locks taken from Luisa Hill. It is comprised of only one chamber, making it the smallest of the canal's five locks. The first vessel is transporting energy and is situated only a few hundred feet from the center wall. Those two tugboats are there to help position it to enter the chamber. This second ship is inside the upper chamber and waiting to be lowered to the level of Miraflores Lake. And here we have a cruise ship that is now departing the locks en route to Miraflores Locks. Once a vessel clears Pedro Miguel, it must navigate across Miraflores Lake. It's only about a mile, and most ships complete the journey in just 15 to 20 minutes. Off to the left and before the locks is Miraflores Dam. Despite being the smallest of the three dams, you should be able to see it from aboard your cruise ship. Immediately following the dam is Miraflores Locks. Both of these vessels you see are conducting northbound transits. The first one is transiting in the east lane, nearest the visitor center, and this second one, in the west lane, provides a close-up view of the electric locomotives and the rails they ride along. Now that we've departed Pedro Miguel, Miraflores, and Cocoli Locks, it's on to the Bridge of the Americas and the Amador Causeway. For that, I need to pull up the map for Section 7, but before doing that, we'll take one last look at the transit map. Section number 7 is the southernmost section, and it extends to Flamenco Island. After departing Miraflores and Cocoli Locks, it takes just 20 to 25 minutes to reach the Bridge of the Americas, the first bridge built to span the Panama Canal. Here's an aerial view of a car carrier commencing a northbound transit, and this one of the cruise ship Infinity as she completes a southbound transit. Construction on the bridge began on October 12, 1959, and took nearly two and a half years before its completion. Before its completion, and for almost 30 years, ferry service was the primary means of connecting North and South America. Even today, 60 years after service ended, you can still see remnants of the piers on both sides of the canal. In this black and white photograph of the Celebrity Infinity, you can see the cement pilings off to the left. After passing under the bridge, you will see the Balboa Yacht Club off to your left. The Yacht Club and the adjacent hotel mark the beginning of the Amador Causeway, which includes three islands and a long, narrow stretch of land that extends two miles from the mainland. Those islands are Naos, Perico and Flamenco from north to south. At the onset near the Yacht Club, the causeway is relatively wide, but by the time it reaches Biodiversity Museum, it's reduced to a thin strip of land. If the Amador Causeway is a scheduled port of call, then your ship will navigate to Perico Island, home of Panama's newest and only cruise port terminal on the Pacific coast. Before constructing this port, all passengers were ferried to and from Flamenco Island aboard tenders. Well, that concludes our southbound transit. It took longer than I expected, but considerably less than an ordinary transit, which takes approximately eight hours. I hope you found the video helpful and informative. Feel free to comment below if you have any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. If you're looking for help planning your cruise or a travel companion during your visit, I encourage you to visit my website dedicated exclusively to Panama Canal excursions. I've added a link to it in the description below. It contains a wealth of helpful information and advice regarding the most popular tours, the best places to shop, and little known and interesting facts about the Panama Canal. If you're cruising to Panama, it's a terrific resource. If you do visit, I'm sure you'll have a wonderful time. Despite its small size, Panama is a beautiful country with plenty of unique offerings. Thanks for your visit, and best wishes.